the K Podcast. I'm DJ Peter Lowe, and joining us for this episode, we've got Stephanie. Hey, hey. And PD Nim, Michaela. Yes, hello, everybody. And for this episode, we'll be answering the question that I know you're all wondering, but we're too afraid to ask. Mom, Dad, where do K-pop songs come from? Well, they're conceived in the minds of songwriters and producers like Matthew Tischler, who joined us for this episode. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, this is me. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yes, thank you so much for coming. In case you didn't know, Matthew is an Emmy and Annie Award-nominated 25-time multi-platinum producer who's credited with songs behind acts like BTS, Twice, EXO, NCT Dream, Taeyeon, Red Velvet, TVXQ, Shiny, BOA, Namie Amuro, Komi Koda, AOA, Taemin, Solhyun, Joey Young, Luhan, Ailey, P1 Harmony, FT Island, and Stray Kids. You know, just to name a few. Yeah, Why, just wow. a, a few. Why stop there? Let's keep the list going. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo. Oh, yeah, there you go. Jojo Siwa. <laughs> yeah, you've produced, a, 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 in addition to this list, hundreds of songs for, for Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, Netflix, DreamWorks. We've yeah. tra- been trying to keep it K-pop busy. Scene. Trying to keep yeah. it busy over here. I don't want to <laughs> get bored. So one thing, Matthew, that we want to do for our listeners is like the K-pop music production, songwriting process is really a black box for a lot of them. So maybe you get this question asked a lot when you're like with friends and family, but like, how, how would you describe your job <laughs> to someone who would like, you know, explain your job to your grandparents? Like, you know, you know how, how would you, how would you describe that to them? <laughs> I always like to say, and maybe this is a little bit reductive, but I always get to say that the, the best part of the job is that I feel like we're just making stuff up for a living, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Mm -hmm. like you get, you know, songs come about in many different ways. There's a lot of different ways you can go from nothing to a finished song, but in all the cases, you're literally just inventing stuff off the top of your head. And yeah, there's a process by which you hone it and edit it and make things as great as it can be, but really it's just, uh, making it up. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that answers, uh, you know, at least the, the kernel of the question. But uh, I do think that's that's how I would tell my grandparents what I do for a living. I just sit around and people uh, <laughs> people tell me to make stuff up. Like, <laughs> I'm imagining your grandparents reaction to what? that. Like, man, no, nobody works anymore. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> They're like the, the response would be, "What? Can, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat? Say it again." Yep, yep, <laughs> exactly. That doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. So, I, when when you say like make stuff up, is that like what what is that initial impetus for you? Like what what is that initial spark in well, uh, in creating for you? I mean, to me, songs are, are usually started in two different ways. Either there's a request. A brief, Mm -hmm. an ask, you know, from somebody other than myself, be it an artist or a label or, you know, a television network in some cases. But um, and then the flip side is when there's no request and you're just in a room with your friends who are also writers and you get together and you're like, oh, we should write a song. What do you want to write today? Well, how are we feeling? Let's let's uh, create something from scratch. And each case is slightly different in the and it's really 50 50, I find in my world that like especially when I'm writing k-pop music a lot of the times there is a a request or a brief Mm -hmm. you'll know which artists are looking for material or who is um, actively working on their next album so in those cases you know sometimes there's been there's there's a concept in place for the next project there might be a theme or a mood or um, a style where everyone's feeling like the artist will want the next project to go and you kind of study up and you do as much thinking as you can about that, about that tone, that tonality. Um, And then once you're kind of armed with that information, then you get to start making stuff up, you know, might put a beat together first that you think is in the style of what you think they might want to hear. Other times you might have a lyrical direction that you start with, You're, you know, if the mood is, um, you know, uh, winter, like a winter theme ballad, you might have an idea for a song, a, a, a song title that might put you in that spirit. And then you build around that. Sometimes you just have little fragments of melodies where you're like, oh, this would be such a really cool melody if we ever get asked to do x 
kind mm-hmm. of a song. And then when that request comes in, you're like, oh, I have that melody that could be perfect for that kind of a thing. Mm. Um, so there's a couple different ways to actually get going when you're making music. But I think, I think in general, there's kind of those, that, that fork in the road right when you sit down is either you've been asked with doing something or asked to do something specific, or you're just sitting in a room with your friends and you're like, let's write something. What, how, how are we feeling? What are we in the mood to write today? Which I actually find a little more daunting because it's limitless and that that scares me. I kind of want to have some guardrails, <laughs> you know, how can you just sit and write anything? Yeah. It's too open-ended. I, I, I like having some, uh, some direction. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that you started with, well, how are we feeling? Right. You can always start with like, how are you feeling today? Or what's something that's on your mind or going on in your life that, that kind of narrows it yeah, down a little bit. And that's the bit. best part of when you're actually in a room writing with an artist, because, uh, you know, the single greatest asset the artist has is their voice and not just their singing voice, but mm. their perspective and their fans yes. are looking to them because they love them and they they want to know what's going on in their life. And and um, so the single greatest asset to having uh, an, an artist in the room is you get to mind them. <laughs> you know mm. you get to mine their brain and their hearts and their <laughs> you know their feelings for things stories emotions perspectives on things that you wouldn't ever think of, mm. otherwise have thought about and then you get to turn their ideas into songs well that that brings me to like another question that i think is on all the fans minds like have you actually been physically in the room with some k-pop idols you know, that's working a great on songs? question a lot kinda... of the time I have not. And we've, we've, you know, technology has been yeah. so incredible and there's wonderful ways where you can work long distance and have these great collaborations without ever being in the same room. So most songs I would say for me, I have not, um, you know, I try to take as many writing trips as possible to Seoul and I've had some great trips there mm. and I have encountered a lot of uh, the artists I've worked with, but oftentimes it's not in the studio context um right have you have you been on zoom calls with them <laughs> or is it more like an asynchronous process like it's you send mostly something, that i think it. it's hard you know with some of these big stars yeah. too it's also really hard to pin them down and also the, listen the plain time oh gosh, change yeah. is also very complicated so mm-hmm. you know i'm in la uh, depending on where where they are in the world at any given moment you know oftentimes they're on tour and even when they're at home in in uh, korea the time change is out of control. Like they're, they'd have to wake up so early in order mm-hmm. to catch the end of my day in Los Angeles. So they're going to be exhausted in the morning. I'm going to be exhausted at night. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just easier to. Yeah. It's, it's kind of only going to work if you fly over there, if you get a exactly, place and are there exactly. long-term. And that's why I love doing writing trips. Yeah. Uh, you know, the pandemic kind of threw a wrench in mm. those plans. I haven't, I, it's been a minute since I've been, uh, since I've been back to Seoul, but I used to go, at least once a year. Um, oh, the dream. Oh, it's so great. I mean, it's so great because you really get immersed in in the music and to spend a week or two solid weeks just sitting in a studio, meet, working with all your favorite collaborators that you never get to see in person. Mm. It's really fun. Yeah. And these are your, your own personal trips or are these... Um, you know, studios and labels reaching out to you, wanting you to, you know, sit on this song camp session or a little they bit flying of both. you out. A little bit of both. I've done things both ways. I certainly love a writing trip uh, that's organized by a label because they have, well, I mean, to, uh, yeah. you know, to what we talked about a minute ago <laughs> about having a direction, it's, it makes things so much easier creatively for me when a label is involved because they have a slate of projects that they're working on and to have access to the staff of the labels and the A&Rs and, and certainly the artists do come through on occasion to be able to have that access and have the specific details in mind of what they're looking for, as opposed to guessing Mm-hmm. You know, and the other advantage of going there for a songwriting camp is there is kind of a more immediate feedback process where you can get an idea started and you can call in someone from the staff into the room and say, hey, we have, uh, you know, this is what we've been, we've been working on for the last hour. What do you what do you think? Is this kind of the right vibe? Does this track sound like it's in the right zone? Do you think the, the these melodies are strong enough? Is this a lyric that they would say? And you can course correct kind of in real time. Mm hmm. Which is which is a lot different than the process when I'm in LA writing a song from start to finish, and then you send 
basically a finished product over and then get notes, then, then, you know, you've done a lot of work and then you have to change stuff. But there's also a lot of collaborations where you don't send a finished totally. product over. Sometimes you send the bare bones of a track and then uh, a, a co-writer or an artist in Korea will add their elements of a track. And then you have an idea for a melody and then they build on the melody and they have a lyric and you have a lyric. So you can, there's kind of no mm. rule or set structure to how a long distance collaboration can go, but it does happen long that just strikes me as so it, it strikes me as so different from, I think, our image of the K-pop industry as being or like the the mainstream music industry processes in general, like idle training is very regimented and exact and specific. So there's this step in this order and you do this and that. Um, but it seems like here is a pocket of some some freedom or space where mm. things don't have to go in order. I don't know. It just strikes me. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. It definitely seems, from my experience at least, that it's a very collaborative little pocket. And, and I've a lot some... of different ways to do it, too, it sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there have also been cases, too, not to, not to confuse things, but, you know, another path is sometimes the label and artist have already selected an instrumental track. Like maybe there's a producer out there who has kind of nailed oh. the vibe of what they want the next single to feel like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and everyone's already approved this feeling. Maybe the instruments sound a certain way or the tonality of the track sounds a certain way. And then they will have other writers uh, contribute melody and lyric ideas on top of those tracks. So that's kind of another way that things can get made long distance in a collaborative fashion where the artist is already involved and already happy with the kind of direction of a, of a song. And it's very easy for people anywhere in the world to kind of add their elements to it independently. Is, is there a shift or a change that you're noticing? I mean, you know, since the, you know, the number of years that you've been doing this, is there like a type or a way of collaborating on a song that you say is becoming more popular or has it still been kind of all over the place? Like, um, I think it's a little bit all over the place. First of all, I can't believe I've been doing this as long as I have. It's a little, I, I, I still think of myself as a young person, but then when I look and I realize that I've been writing, what year is it now? It's, it's crazy. Cause I feel like, uh, like I still feel like I'm a young guy in my heart, but then I look at the years and I realize I've been making K-pop since like 2010. Ooh, right. wow. That was the, right. the first credit that we saw was you participated on a B side on on the Queen on Boa's yes. ten year anniversary <laughs> album. Queen back in of K pop, undisputed. Yes. Mm -hmm. She's the best. That was such a great experience working on that. I don't want to lose sight of the question that you asked, but no, I, no, you did. Oh, good. You did make How was me. It? I mean, that was such a fun, a funny experience because I obviously I was aware of K pop and I. Uh, but it n never occurred to me that I would fit into that puzzle in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but through some collaborators, that song, we had written uh, this song in Toronto when I still lived in Canada. And uh, one of my co-writers had sent it to SM and they loved the song and they wanted her to record it. And I believe they hired her. I believe her brother is actually playing the piano on that track. Oh, wow. um, and the two of them, kind of took the song we had written and turned it into this like glorious, like, you know, beautiful ballad. Yeah. And that was my first experience in K-pop and obviously fell in love with it um, and realized that it was, you know, K-pop is everything I love about music Aww. and kind of none of the things that I hate about music. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like just the best place for me to be making music and all of my sensibilities I find are so in sync with what's going on in that in that community and you know i'm such a sucker for big melodies and i don't like rules like i, I love that you can be versatile you can write ballads you can do dance tracks you can do a little hip-hop you can do this mm. kind of a little bit of everything so that's kind of that's kind of what i took to to this style of music so early on and then not to ramble but just thinking about Please. boa i met her years later, completely <gasps> mm. unrelated to this song. Uh, she was in a movie called 
make your move. Is that what it's yep. called? Oh, yep. yes. I remember. Yeah. So <laughs> with, with Derek Huff, who incidentally yep. lives across the road from me, which is very mm. funny. I see him mm-hmm. taking out the trash, which is <laughs> hysterical. Um, and I went to the premiere of that movie in Los Angeles because I had written a song for it unrelated to boa or k-pop at all it was just a pop song that i had written that they used in one scene of the movie so i i went to this premiere event and there she was and i'm Mm. like oh my goodness it's you (laughs) and i had no idea if she would know me or even remember the song because by this point it had been Mm -hmm. you know she has like thousands of songs (laughs) exactly and i had a chance to you know introduce myself and i'm like you don't know me but i'm matthew tischler i was one of the co-writers on your song don't know what to say and she remembered the song and she's like, oh, oh, thank you so much for such a beautiful song. And we got a we got a selfie together wow. and it was a very lovely experience. And that was my that was my one and only time meeting meeting the queen herself. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so sweet. Thanks for sharing that. Once yeah, in a, it was lifetime. a fun memory. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me that that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that was back in 2010 when you worked on that song with Bola. Worked so. on that song in 2010. How, yeah. how has the your experience with the industry changed um, since well, then in well, the process? One, you know, certainly the way my uh, uh, collaborations have changed when I was getting started and I lived in Canada, I didn't know a lot of people. So a lot, a lot of those songs were more self-contained. Like I was writing them all, mm. almost in full um, with my co-writers in Canada And we would send them to labels and they would choose to record them or not. Oftentimes they would have notes either from the label or from the artist themselves. And we would, we would work together to finish things. But for the most part, the songs were kind of written almost to completion. But then when I moved to LA and, you know, I started to get more involved in the K-pop business and I started to become closer with the, with the record labels. And I started to, have more of a friendly collaborative relationship, the style of collaborations got to be a little bit more flexible. And that's when I would start, you know, Oh, here's a track I started that I think would be good for this artist. What do you think? And they would say, Oh, this sounds really good. Go, Mm. you know, maybe try, try a, you know, if you do a lyric that's about this theme, that could be a really good idea. Or the other way around. Sometimes I would have kind of like a stripped down, melodic idea and lyric and I would send it to someone who would then produce a track underneath it and just kind of looking for opportunities for collaboration that are less traditional Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly as I started to actually meet Korean writers those were even greater opportunities for collaboration where uh, we would start taking trips they would either come here I would go there this is when we would start emailing ideas back and forth, you know, all this kind of, as everyone started to rely more and more on technology. So it was not such a burden to be emailing fragments of ideas back and forth. Are there, uh, maybe this is like two in the weeds, but like, are there other like cloud uh, tools like to to have more of that (laughs) seamless, like collaboration, you know, on tracks and stuff? You know, there are, but I... I've not really messed around with them. I I primarily produce in Cubase, which is one uh-huh. of the main computer programs that people can use. And I believe they have a feature where you can like electronically tap in to someone else's Cubase mm. and you guys can like record in real time. But I've never, I've never exactly done that. Certainly now I think everyone just uses Zoom. There's a program called Source Connect or Audio Movers where you can hear like a high res audio feed. So there's ways to kind of be flexible. Zoom is pretty tight, though there's like an audio lag sometimes, yeah. so it's kind of tricky. Um, nothing beats being in a room, yeah, oh, yeah, or just doing it completely uh, independently, As- asynchronous. What's I can never say oh, the asynchronously. word properly. Yeah. Asynchronously, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's such a perfect word to describe. Uh, how uh, you can I do kind it. of want to return back on um, what you were mentioning earlier around. Uh, you'll get a brief, so like uh, what how do those usually come in and like, how descriptive are they? Like, you know, how much yeah, guidance maybe are you, if you have given? an example from your oh, yeah, inbox? Yeah, yeah. You don't Definitely. have to say oh, here, who it's from, but like reread it off to it. <laughs> here I go. Let me open up my email and let yes. me, let me just scroll back a couple years just so I don't yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. blow any NDAs. <laughs> um, I love getting briefs because 
the way they're written, first of all, they're they're oftentimes organized by the A and Rs at the record label who are working in direct uh, collaboration with the artists themselves. So they'll come up with a vision for what they're looking for. Um, and to me, they're like perfectly descriptive. Like they're descriptive enough while giving you freedom to do kind of whatever you want. Like different so, ways to interpret it. Interpret exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, they'll usually start a lead by saying so-and-so is looking for their next single and they'll give a couple links of some past songs that they've done. So if you're not familiar with the group, you can go down memory lane and uh, uh, become acquainted. But of course, we all know what everyone's up to. <laughs> um, and then they'll kind of talk about what uh, what they're looking for. I'm trying to find a good brief to see if I can read something word for word. So, you know, the like they might say, we're looking for a mid-tempo ballad that would be suitable as like a fan song for like the last song of a concert, something that everyone can turn their flashlights onto and wave their arms back and forth and, Ooh. you know, sing along a cappella. So immediately you Whoa. have a picture in your mind of like what that needs to feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then oh, that's yeah. enough for, for me to like get started on something. Cause I've, you know, we've all heard hundreds of songs that have give you that feel and you can kind of imagine it. You can like put yourself in the stadium and they've, you know, your, your idol's done like a two hour incredible concert. And like, it's that last song they're saying good night and they come and they sit right on the edge of the stage. Oh. And you know, you put yourself in that moment and you're like, what, what do I want to hear as the fan? And I'm imagining that band up on stage and I, you know, you just start making stuff up. Have you, have you attended many concerts in person? Yes, but not as many as I would like. Um, I've actually never been to a K-pop show while in Korea, which sucks mm. because the timing's never worked out. And I feel like that would be the the greatest. But mm-hmm. I do try to see I do try to see as many groups as I can when they're in LA. I just saw P1 Harmony. Oh, uh, cool. yeah. We saw them when they were up here. Y- oh yeah. Did you see that just a couple weeks ago? Oh no, not the tour, the last tour. summer. The last yeah. Tour, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I saw both of those. They were so great. Yeah. So great. I mean, they have such a fun vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's really cool to see their fan base grow and just see how the, the fans of it, they just, I don't know, the fans just seem really connected, mm-hmm. uh, really connected to them. I got to see twice last <gasps> summer they were in LA. Um, I'm trying to think who I, who else I've seen in LA. Oh, I just saw Espa. That, that mm. was, when was that? A few months ago in, in Los Angeles. They were yeah, amazing. Yeah, you've seen some heavy hitters. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind, I, I spoke at KCON a couple of years ago in L.A. Oh, and they, okay. you know, do these incredible showcase performances at Staples Center. You oh, know, right. it's yeah. like 30,000 seats or whatever. And Michaela was just there at last KCON. Oh, yeah. did you go? Oh, yeah. No, it was great. The first I, first KCON in a while. So it was great to, to see all these artists who we've been listening to for years finally get to perform on stage. That's cool. That's cool. I wish I got to go. I didn't go this that that year. Uh, my my last time there, I think, was 2019, right before the pandemic or so. Mm-hmm. But I love those events because it's such a great opportunity to see a bunch of different artists and and uh, you know, it's it's such a you know, for someone like me who lives in LA, working in a different music market, it's rare to be immersed with the music that you're making. You know, I'm not writing songs that. I hear on the radio in a restaurant mm. in Los Angeles for the most part. I mean, there are rare occasions. Um, so to be at a K-pop show, it's like a, a rare chance to like see the impact, mm-hmm. not only of my songs, but of the, of the entire genre in general. And it's kind of wild to be in Los Angeles and see, and see how this music is translating around the world. Yeah. Well, for more of that, do I have an event for you? Our very <laughs> own DJ Peter Lowe is oh, DJing goodness, no. a K-pop party <laughs> in LA. You do not you have should to plug go. that. Yeah. When is it? Let's get oh, the deets. It, it's 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 next Friday. This this episode Woo! will come out after that. Oh, yeah. too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, but Matthew, you can go. Yeah. I could still probably sure. go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I, I want to turn things back. So Matthew, you, you were talking to earlier about like, hey, there, there's something really fun. Like K-pop is all the fun in in music. Um, I, I want to press on that a little further. So like, what what do you think is is unique about K-pop? Like either 
in the sound or even how like, you know, the process like how it's of, produced. How it's made. Yeah. Yeah. Like I what? Mean, Okay, there's a couple things that immediately come to mind. I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget all the things I'm thinking about. But first of all, one of the first things that comes to mind is there's such uh, an iconic use of vocals mm. that I think is different from, you know, certainly American pop music. I, I mean, vocals are obviously at the center of American pop too, but in K pop, there's kind of no limit to what you can do. There, like you can do big harmonies, you can have crazy melodies, you can you can kind of be very playful with the tonality of mm. the voice. Yeah. Whereas I find certainly right now in American pop, oh no, everything kind of sounds the same, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. And everyone's trying to be so cool, and they all have that yes. same you know, indie artist voice. I mean, I'm generalizing Ooh. here, of course. They're, no, you're uh, right, you're they're right. They're wonderful singers. They're just it. like over it. Like I'm too cool for school. <laughs> yeah, they're trying so hard to be cool. Um, but but I feel like there isn't that same, that limitation in K-pop. And I think that also ties into the next thing that I would say is just about the sound in general, having no rules, really. Mm-hmm. I think that's also different from... American pop and what makes it fun for me is that it's always changing. Like, like a song isn't static, you know, Mm -hmm. if you turn on a lot of the radio here, you'll just hear the same four bar loop over and over. Four might even be generous. Sometimes it's like a one one or two bar loop (laughs) and the melodies are kind of very static and you can kind of drop in at any point in the song and you know what song it is because it always sounds, you know, there's no real variation. But I almost feel like the name of the game in K-pop is to have, the, like, to keep it evolving and changing with throughout the course of the song. It's just got to be so interesting at all times. And yeah. it's like a, re, it's a kind of a different way of thinking about repetition and variation, which are, you know, the main tenets of songwriting in general. You want to repeat things enough so they're catchy, but you want to vary them enough so that they're satisfying to the ear when a listener hears them. So that interplay is what I think has the most uh, iconic difference in K-pop because I think you can really push the variation and it's not unusual for different song sections to sound like they could be from completely different yeah. songs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I want to, I want to ask about that. Like maybe this is a controversial question, but like, what do you think of those K-pop songs where like the verse is like so radically different than like the the pre-chorus or the chorus? Like, I mean, why not? Yeah, yeah. why not? I mean, I, I think if every song was like that, that might be a that might get tired too. So I think it's uh-huh. all about just playing with it and and uh, doing what feels right for any given song. Yeah. <laughs> why do you hate that? I <laughs> kind of laugh about it sometimes on, yeah. when it's done to the extreme. Mm-hmm. Like we're thinking about NCT, for example. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, just like yeah, take or, take it to um, the limit. Well, what YG has had a oh, formula yeah. that we we like to you know laugh about a lot. That's like okay, you've got the the Teddy Park, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the versus dance break and party then, yeah, chorus. dance break and party chorus. The third chorus is the party chorus where they like change things up. Um, but like, like Espa, a lot of their discography, I, I look at their songs and it's like, what, like, you know, non sequitur yeah. things, but at the same time, you know, one or two, like two or three lessons later, it's like, oh my God, it's like an earworm. Like that mm. was, you know, the, like, it feels like that was the strategy. Mm. Um, there's always, that, it's, uh, I think of these, these songs as like, there's, there's always something new to listen for mm-hmm. every time you hear it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like it has just the right amount of complexity, though it appears simple uh, on first listen. But every time you listen, there's like new things. It's so much ear candy, so many variations, um, kind of something fresh to pick up on each time you hear, which I think, I mean, to me at least, that's why I like listening to the same songs over and over again, because mm-hmm. I'm picking up on things I hadn't heard the first time. And then you're right. They do become earworms and they get like ingrained in your soul. And you're like, why am I humming this? <laughs> yeah, I, this song I heard two days ago. So I yeah. have, I, I mean, question just came to me. I used to work at YouTube in the like content ID copyright department. 
And so I, I would love if you could talk a little bit about your, your approach or relationship to copyright or like not writing something that exactly sounds like something else. Like, do, does it cross your mind? Are there tools or processes with copyright? That's a great question. Um, because, you know, as artists, we're only as good as what has come before. And, you know, there's only 12 notes and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think everyone is the, every creator is like the embodiment of everything they've ever heard before. Yeah. And people are naturally influenced by what they like and what they've already heard. And when you go to create, you know, it can certainly be tempting to, well, I should say it's only natural that you, that you yeah. would rely on what, what's in your bones. But then that's where the artistic side kind of comes in. It's how can you harness everything you've ever heard and listened to and things that you love and make them fresh and mm -hmm. kind of push it a little bit further. You know, a lot of artists mm -hmm. have gotten in trouble recently um, for songs that sound too similar. And there've been a couple big lawsuits for, uh, over, over that kind of stuff. So it can be tricky, but you know, when you're, when you're creating it, you just have to like, not for me, at least I don't want to listen yeah. To existing songs, like too close right. to when I'm actually writing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like you can't I, get it out of your head. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Because. Yeah. And especially when other songs are referenced in like, sometimes your co-writer might say, oh, we should do something that's in this zone. Oh. It's like, okay, look at, I understand what you mean because it has a certain feeling. So, so you kind of have to s distill it down to the essence. Yeah. Like what is that feeling that you're getting from that song and how can we make it new mm. versus, Ooh, let's take those chords or, Oh, yeah, let's take the take chords that. and just change one note or something. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of my trick for how to be inspired by the things I've loved in the past without actually stealing anything. Cause mm. you don't want to be a, a yeah. thief. Oh, right. I don't want to be sued. Um, of course not. And I never have been. Yay. <laughs> Yay for not being sued. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stephanie, Michaela, is there anything that, I know we've had a list of questions earlier, is there anything that you want to maybe address in that before diving into song-specific things? Or should we just move on to the song-specific? Mm, I do think I want to go back to, because we've talked a lot about the things that you you like about the K-pop industry in general and, and songwriting. Are there any things you dislike or any things you would like to change mm. or think that can be done better? That's a good question. Uh, nothing immediately comes to mind. It's not like I I have some massive gripe that I'm like, oh, now you've asked me this question, and I'm gonna <laughs> we're gonna change the business. Right. No, I'm sure there are things that could be improved. I'm sure other parts of the business that I'm not involved in could be improved. Um, but as far as songwriting, I mean, I, you know, one of one of the challenges I'm seeing that is frustrating on one side, but also inspiring on the other side is that as K-pop's popularity uh, expands around the world, you're starting to see more and more writers getting involved and trying to get involved. And um, oftentimes they don't uh, have the same kind of care that I might, or that my other collaborators who've been doing this a long time might, or they don't have the same relationships. And uh, so on one hand, it's kind of interesting to see a lot of fresh competition from a lot of new producers, a lot of songwriters. But on the other hand, I think that's actually kind of inspiring because you have all these fresh voices that are coming at it, um, adding their flavor into the mix. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm trying not to be jaded about, oh, look at all these people that, you know, <laughs> I've been at this since 2010. Uh, How dare they? It's whippersnappers. Um, right. But of course, that's the nature of the business. It's, uh, you know, there's a whole new group of uh, writers out there who are taking to K-pop just like I did. And I hope that they have the same care um, and attention to detail that uh, that I that I have and that my some of my longtime collaborators and friends have. But it's exciting to see what they can bring to the table, too. So oh, it sounds like you would be a really good mentor for <laughs> new new songwriters coming I in. I mean, I hope like, I would. I have I have yeah. worked with a lot of younger writers and it is cool to see their take on on music and also the songwriting process, because, you know, as a writer who's been writing for, you know, 10 or 15 years now, I have my ways of kind of approaching things. And certainly, you know, a 20 year old songwriter has a much different take <laughs> on how they might begin a song. 
Uh-huh. Um, so that's kind of cool too, just to like shake up, work with younger writers so it can shake up my own, my own creative mm. process. Is that there that any- makes me think of yeah. TikTok. Have oh, you, right. have you ever been specifically <laughs> guided to like, Hey, can you make something that's good for TikTok? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I've ne- thankfully I've never actually had that as a specific oh, wow. ask because I think that would be soul crushing. I know that uh, exists and I know that's a huge battle and I know right. everyone is hoping for a viral TikTok sensation. I just don't think that can be manufactured. I think mm. the, the audience can sniff it out mm-hmm. when it sounds like it's been, uh, you know, try when, when a bunch of grown-ups are in a room trying to yes. make something go viral <laughs> oh, it's, gonna, yeah. it's gonna get the you know the ick um <laughs> but and that was icky me even saying that word which is my case in point hmm. um so no i've never had anyone specifically say try to make a viral hit but of course everyone wants it and you're That's always thinking, like oh. out there in <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think all you can do as a creator is really look at each piece of your song and hope that it's the best it can be. Hope that there's something hooky in every moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then look at what what the audience chooses to respond to. That's on them. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, if they if they fall in love with your chorus, wonderful. If they fall in love with your, you know, the rap in the second verse and that's what becomes the, you know, the viral 12 seconds. Great. Um, yeah and if nothing does from your song what can i do mm. you know <laughs> yeah yep. would you say like um your like your style or, or your signature sound has changed over the years or are there just things that you've noticed about yourself and uh in producing over the years i mean i try to be as versatile as possible i love so much different so much different music and my my influences are so varied like mm-hmm. growing up i was a huge you know i loved michael jackson i also loved you know big vocals like you know celine dion i loved david foster like those kind of big productions i also loved a lot of musical theater which i think is no surprise why you know the other half of my discography is working on disney and disney channel and animation mm-hmm. um i loved you know one of the first albums i ever got was Ace of Bass, The Sign. So I think, you know, just pure, perfect pop masterpieces are like in my diet. Like I, I just have strive every day to do that. Also like rock me, you know, like I grew up, like one of my first albums was, uh, you know, No Doubt and uh, uh, Alanis Morissette. So I've, I've actually, I've lost sight of the question. I was, I was rambling. Well, if, 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 if just your own sound has changed, uh, oh, if my own sound has changed, I mean, yeah. yeah, I think it, I think it probably has. I mean, some things I think never go out of fashion. Like I always am the one that's getting asked for ballads mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I right. love especially, writing them. Especially in this, the K-pop realm. Yeah. And again, it's like no surprise that that I've become known as someone who can deliver ballads because that's what I love to do. I love to sit there at the piano and come up with incredible melodies. I love working with great singers who can also mm-hmm. help write these melodies and can deliver them. Um, so a lot of my co-writers are really fantastic singers. And then, you know, the, the vocalists in Korea, like these idols are unbelievable singers. Yeah. So they're like some of the, you know, some of the only people on the planet who can, who can actually pull off some of these wide ranging melodies. Um, but I do, I do try to work with younger writers and younger producers and, you know, try to shake up my sounds and try to do stuff that's maybe a little bit out of my comfort zone yeah. um, just to keep things interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So just wrapping up the, the section, we did want to ask you, um, what level of involvement does your name get added in the credit of an album? You know, going back to, you know, th- there's a lot of you know, nameless material out there, ghost writers who are involved with projects that you know, only comes out years later that, oh yeah, I worked on that, even though they're not officially listed. So can you give us a little insight into that process of like where, where your name gets put on the track? And, and, and also like, what does that, what does that mean to you? Like having your name versus not like when you do the work? Well, I mean, I can only speak from my own experiences. I've been very fortunate where I've always been credited mm. on on the projects that I work on. I mean, I'm certainly uh, listed with my other co-writers and collaborators. Um, I've never felt like I've been, 
you know, asked to suppress my involvement in any work. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, if that's, if you've heard that from other people, that that's a common thing, but I haven't, I haven't really experienced that. You know, I know these songs are big collaborations and there's a lot of people involved. I would never claim to be like the only, you know, this song happened because of me. It's just not the case. <laughs> I mean, these mm-hmm. songs are, you know, you have a lot of writers on some of these songs and everyone has, uh, you know, contributed and everyone should be credited appropriately, I think. Yeah. Is that is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that I, I guess, question? well, maybe, maybe this is more of a technical uh maybe even legal question, but like at what point, like, well, I contributed this hi-hat. <laughs> oh, you know? I see what you're saying. Like, I mean, I mean, you know, that's kind of an interesting overall music business question because, you know, I got my start writing songs from the ground up in a room with one or two other people and kind of the, the prevailing theory is that if you're in a room and you write a song from the ground up, you're doing equal splits with whoever else is in the room. Uh And oftentimes if there's just two or three writers, it's pretty easy. You each get half or you get a third, or if there's a fourth writer, you each get 25% and you call it a day. That's very much the like Nashville style of songwriting. That's kind of how I learned growing up in Canada, but with technology, you know, kind of changing the collaborative process. Sometimes tracks are made first, sometimes top lines are in, and then you're making tracks after. Sometimes you have a track and then multiple different people are contributing to the top line. I see what you mean, how it can make things a little bit more ambiguous and there, and it's bent the rules for how people can be compensated. Like certainly song splits uh-huh. are not always equal in my world. They still tend to be because that's still how I choose to collaborate with my, with my people. I like everyone to feel like, uh, you know, they've contributed and I, I, you know, we want everyone to contribute equally. But of course, there are instances where that's not the case. Sometimes you've basically written a song and then at the last second, someone has an idea and mm-hmm. writes a new bridge. Uh, but they're, if they're a good person, hopefully they're, they're the kind of person who's like, oh, listen, I only did the bridge. Just give me uh, you know, a couple percent or, or whatever. But I do think those are conversations that have to be had between each team independently and only only they know what's fair. Hopefully no, no one's being unscrupulous and trying to minimize other people's shares. Hopefully it's all reasonable. I'm sure there are people who are getting shares of songs for contributing hi hats. Um, (laughs) And I don't think that, you know, not specifically in the K-pop market, but I think in general, there might be someone in the back of the room that was, uh, you know, getting uh getting getting the snacks ready for all the other people and they were in the room so they're going to take <laughs> a percent or or sometimes you hear about artists who weren't actually involved yes who come in at the 11th hour and <laughs> want to we take were a piece ask. <laughs> um i've listen i i don't think that i mean i've never experienced okay. that in k-pop or sure. beyond i know that that happens uh not in k-pop i've certainly heard of that in the american music business mm. um but all of the artists, you know, all the songs that I've worked on that have K-pop artists credited, they have genuinely earned their share, mm. if not more. So I awesome. hope that answers your question and clarifies. Yeah, I think our uh, fans will be very heartened to hear uh, that like affirmation from you. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I don't think there's any of that. Uh, yes. Your favorite idols are not slacking off, taking credit. <laughs> no, and I, no, and I think it, it it also is because there is a great respect for the creative process, and I think a lot of the artists truly respect the writers that have given their time and efforts to to collaborate on music for them. So I I don't think it's in their hearts to to take a piece for doing nothing. Mm. I really don't. Even at the highest levels, I don't think I don't think that exists. But of course, I can only speak from my own experience. And I've I've only had wonderful experiences oh, with all the artists I've worked with. I feel so warm and fuzzy. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's what I'm known for. Giving people <laughs> yeah. warm and fuzzies. All right. Well, let's uh move along here to song. I mean, this is all really good. Thank thank you, Matthew, for for all this. Like honestly, it almost feels like insider <laughs> information. Mm-hmm. Like you're 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 opening the uh the, the curtain, you're drawing the curtain, letting us see how this this world works. And I think our listeners really appreciate it. Um, 
But now we wanted to hear more just like specific things and and some songs that you've worked on. So I'll hand it over to Stephanie. I think you you had the first one here. Sure. So um, one of one of my favorites out of the songs that you've written is Astro Bad Idea. Ah, I don't know (laughs) if you want us to play a clip of it. I, I think I remember that. You remember? All I got is bad, 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 bad ideas. ideas. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so that, catchy. Thank you so much. That was such a fun one. I, I have great memories of doing that song um, in LA mm. with a few of my Korean co-writer friends who were in town visiting from Korea, and they had brought a bunch of tracks with them. Ah. And we had just, I have, I have a funny memory because I had just moved into my new house and my studio wasn't set up properly yet. So I was in like a guest bedroom on a desk wow. with like a very makeshift setup. And I had them come into the house and they had played me a couple tracks and we kind of zeroed in on this one. And obviously, you know, you the minute you hear oh, yeah. like a funky bass line that yeah. you like a guitar that's going through it. That's just super funky. And yeah. it immediately took me to like, you know, those, those Michael Jackson vibes. Mm. Um, And I think on that one, I literally set up a microphone and just kind of had the track going and kind of hit record and, you know, keep saying it, but made stuff up and Mm -hmm. you just sing along, you get in the spirit, you're imagining, you know, you're imagining the artist that you're writing for and you're like, uh, all I got is bad, bad, bad bad idea. And you know, I'm not that the lyric came out in that, but you know, you're doing like funky, melody, yeah. funky melodies, you're doing things that are super rhythmic, you know, you want to lock in tight with the, with the drums. So, um, maybe getting a little dance party going on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, we had probably done a bunch of takes kind of, of melody things, just kind of ad libbing and riffing. And before too long, you're like, Ooh, that, that's a really cool hook. Mm-hmm. Like that should be the title. And then, you know, I remember kind of dragging regions around in, in Cubase, um, mm-hmm. you know, little waveforms around being like, ooh, and what if we copied it and pasted it there? And, oh, we need a, p- a piece of melody to fill this gap. And then I would try a couple of things and we'd all be like, oh, yeah, that's the one. Let's do that. Yep. And then, you know, you kind of build a melodic arc of the mm. song. And then and I think we had the concept of bad idea or bad ideas okay. at the time. I can't remember exactly how we had it. And then you just kind of put a little lyric together that's in the spirit of of the vibe. You know, I, I try to, I, lyrics aren't my strong suit. And uh, a lot of times they're changed anyways. Mm. So I, uh, you know, try to go with my gut and just make sure it sounds good. I want the rhymes to all be in place. I want mm. to create a feeling. But I, a lot of my songs in particular, uh, I can't say that they're poetry, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, I don't think we can say that about most K-pop lyrics. <laughs> so you're good. Um, so that's that's kind of how that one came to be. That one was definitely track first from my amazing co- co-writers and co-producers, and then we we did like a melody, and then yep. and then lyric last. Mm, that makes perfect sense. And as as you're describing the process, I I do some dance. I teach dance and I choreograph routines ah. to songs, and so the choreography process like sounds really similar, just like moving, freestyling. And then, ooh, there's some click. There's some accidental right. click, like, ooh, that move like really matches. Okay. And then build on that. Right. I mean, I think that's how the best creatives probably structure their process anyway. It's you, you, you have to, you, there's like an inventive phase where mm. you just make stuff up and you're creating and inventing and you're not thinking and you're just going with your gut. Just do it. Yeah. And then there's the edit. Then there's the editing Yes, where you can listen back and be like, Ooh, this was good. This was good. Or what if we put that there? This, this is crap. Let's, uh, mm. we need something new for these four bars. Um, it gets tricky when you're self editing in real time yeah, because then you're wearing two hats at once. You're like thinking with your left brain and your right brain, and then it gets messy and then you get self-conscious and mm. then, and then it's just bad. Oh yeah. I've definitely been stuck before. Yeah. <laughs> like exactly. Stuck in a loop. Exactly. And that's, that's where I imagine the, you know, being in the room with people, getting that live iterative feedback really helps. Yeah. Yeah. You're feeding off each other's energy and one little look or one little thing from somebody can send you down a, down a rabbit hole, good or bad. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If someone's feeling it and they give you like that look of encouragement, you, you just know to keep going. And, yeah, run with it. You know, if someone uh, makes like a, you know, uh, ooh, I yeah. don't know about that kind of <laughs> kind of face and you're like, oh shit, they think oh. I suck. Uh, they didn't like that. I don't know. Then you start getting all in your head. Yeah. And, uh, oh, wow. Then the day's over. Then you're like, all right, let's just call it because I can't rebound from this. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No I'm way. Kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to no. keep it going after that. You got to keep going. No, you can't take anything too seriously mm. or personally, I mean, because yes, uh, yes. Uh, it's just music. Yeah. Well, I also I also wanted to mention the last uh, producers that we we talked to was uh, Benji and Rockman, and they had also mentioned that you know that collaborative par- process can be fun, but it can also be like a very vulnerable moment when you're you know trying something and it doesn't work, and uh-huh. you, when you when you get in that room with the right kind of people, that's really when you can make the most beautiful totally. things come out. And you know, I think I think it's almost like dating and marriage Ooh. in a way because. You know, when I moved to L.A., it's this whole new pool of writers and you, you're you basically dating. It's like five days a week. You have a new session with a different writer and you're meeting mm-hmm. so many people and you either jive or you don't. And after a couple of years of being here, you really kind of zero in on who who you click with and who you don't. And my my circle of collaborators has kind of shrunk in many ways because I know that there's certain people I can rely on to do certain kinds of things with Mm -hmm. me. And I know that when we get in a room, we're just going to be firing on all cylinders together and we're going to bring out the best in each other. And those are the people you want to (laughs) marry. You know, those are the people you want to make song babies with. (laughs) So I think that you're, you're those other producers you interviewed are totally right because Mm -hmm. they your your partner that day is either going to bring out your best or your worst and it's either going to make a great song or a shit song (laughs) so you want to work with people who are going to bring out your best okay and then going back to to what you mentioned before about songs being you know lyrics changing over time especially after the initial demos of of songs the the next song that i wanted to talk about um was from another vocal queen ailey uh her song sweater that came back in 2019 um there was official english version released of that song yeah and my question was like how close that version was to to the original um that's a great question because I actually have not heard that song in a very long time. So I can't remember oh, okay. <laughs> exactly what I, if I had to guess, I would think that the English version is probably very close, if not identical to what we originally wrote Um, in English. I think they probably did it close, if not the same. Does that answer what you asked? Yeah, because we we in K-pop, there are oftentimes where we'll get English versions of songs. And uh, most of the time, right, you're submitting all of your songs in English initially. Right. And then a, a Korean writer will come over and, and change to to whatever they're they need for, for the project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that you're you're definitely right. That's certainly how it works most of the time. But that the English version of Sweater, I'm pretty sure, was our original English lyric. Yeah. And the next song that we wanted to talk about was FT Island. So a a band in K-pop, their song Unthinkable that came out in 2021. Um, First off, because, you know, FT Island is is a band, uh, how different the the process of writing that song was, knowing that they would probably be performing that with like real instruments in in live performances, if that affected your, your process in any way with that song. That song took a very long time to make over, I think, years um, and had many different versions of it. Um, I think we originally wrote it with just piano. And then I think once we knew the band was interested in it, we targeted it to suit them a little bit better and started to add all the instruments and, you know, gave it more of a of a band feel and I remember kind of going back and forth many times, uh, making sure we got it just exactly right. And I'm very proud of the end result. I think I think the end result is really great. And obviously the band killed it. And I I have not seen them play it live yet. I don't I I have not looked for it. I, I should probably see if they've had a chance to perform it live. Have you seen them do it? I don't think so. No, not yet. 
Oh, I should, I should go down the rabbit hole and Google and see if they've ever uh, played it live, um, like in a concert or something. But uh, that was a fun, that was a fun process, although, although long. Mm-hmm. And then I think they had, you know, they'd wanted for a project and it didn't come out on that project. And then, you know, another year goes by and then they try to put it on the next project. And then I think it didn't happen on that. And then, you know, those kind of things where it just didn't quite have a, a release date. Um, but finally it came out and the world has uh, now heard our song. Is that very common for for you to work on a project and have it, if you know, the, the actual release be years later? That, I would say that's more the rarity. Usually things are pretty fast. You know, you, you make a bunch, you make music that kind of feels of the moment. You know, an artist is gearing up for their next project. That's probably six to eight months down the line that there, it does seem like a bit of a fast and furious process. Um, but occasionally, occasionally you get stuck in a, in a situation where everyone's feeling great about the song and there's just no, no no release opportunity for various reasons. Right. You know, sometimes they shelve an album. Sometimes one of the band members leaves the band and they're filling the spot. Sometimes, uh, you know, maybe it gets dropped from the project and then you pray a year later, they, they remember it exists, <laughs> you know? All right. So I'll, I'll, by the way, I think we're going to start wrapping up here. Thank you for your time uh, so far, Matthew. Really appreciate it. No but, problem. My pleasure. Um, I hope this is all helpful. Oh yeah, no, it, it's awesome. So I was looking at um, other songs and, and just kind of going through your, your uh, discography and um, Stray Kids is uh, Stop uh, in yes. 2019. That one seemed the most like different from, from other songs that you've produced and that it has like a lot of like really heavy uh, electronic dance music elements. So, like you, you were describing earlier, you look all you look. You, you think about the artist. You think about what they've produced today. Was that a case where, like, oh, Stray Kids? They have a lot of EDM vibes. Therefore, I'm going to try something in that vein. Or, or how did this song come about? Yeah, hundred percent. And I'm actually very proud of that song for that reason because be. I love when people think that all I can make are ballads, and I'm like, aha! But have you heard? I'll show uh, you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Right. No, that was a great, that's a great example to talk about because that was a real collaboration with a lot of different people and kind of came about in a, in a different way than I often will write. That one, I think, came from a request from the label looking for, you know, kind of performance-based tracks for Stray Kids. And, you know, I uh, was obviously aware of them and was a fan of them at that point, but I did a big deep dive into their stuff and kind of thought, oh, what would kind of be cool for for the next project? And I called one of my longtime collaborators, Crash Cove, uh, mm. who we've worked on a lot of things together. He was a co-producer on a song I did for BTS called Dimple. We've done a lot of stuff together. And he is like my my edm guru you know this guy just lives and breathes this that kind of cool kind of edgy aggressive uh track kind of vibe which is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse when i i could <laughs> i could i could figure it out but it's not what's going to come out naturally if i sit down at the computer and start to put a track together um so i had him try a couple things and he came up with the with the basis of that beat which we sent mm -hmm. to the label um, very quickly. They approved it. I think they had shared it around the label. I think the band had heard it. Everyone kind of felt, ooh, this is a cool track that sounds like it could be something for us. And then we moved on to phase two, which was creating you know, a top line for it. And we did a pass of, um, of some ideas. The band did a pass and I, you know, we kind of sent our ideas and they kind of took what we had and transformed it into what you now know as stop and road not taken, which is kind of its counterpart. They kind of mm -hmm. go together. They were both like the two intro tracks from two, uh, from two of their projects. So if you, you can kind of sync one right up to the other wow. and they play I'm gonna continuously. Do that yeah. yeah. If you notice stop kind of just starts with the word stop. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes. If you listen to the end of the previous song, I'm pretty sure they were designed to kind of connect. Yeah. One listening experience. Right. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. It's exactly. like, a, that's an Easter egg. That's so fun. Yeah. That is an Easter egg. That is an Easter egg. Um, so that one was a true collaboration. 
uh, between me and Crash Cove and Andrew Underberg, who's one of my other longtime collaborators, and also a further collaboration with with the members of the band who took our track and took mm. all of our top lines and really went and did their own thing. I mean, they 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 added so much to that song that I could not have even dreamed of. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's what Stray Kids are known for, right? They have members who are very involved in the production of their songs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were really hands on and they they took our track elements and, you know, pushed them further and messed them up in a, in a good way, mm. you know, pushed them further, kind of played with played with all the elements. Yeah, and, that takes confidence. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They did. What, a, was there. Sorry. What, was there an example of them like, you know, taking things in a, in a different way or. You know, I off the top of my head, I can't remember. A sp- you mean on this song? I, yeah, I have yeah, to. Sure. I have to compare our early demos to the finished product. I, I certainly remember. You know, definitely a lot of the top line they contributed in ways that we couldn't have. Like they wrote a lot of the verses and the raps that are so specific to them. Uh-huh. I I know they worked on the track and completely transformed it. But I I in, as far as specific elements. Sure. I'd have to so, uh, I'd have to do a good forensic analysis before I could tell you. Oh, oh good. But no, <laughs> totally, that's really yeah. interesting to hear, though. Just just how much uh, Stray Kids have, have been involved in and to that extent. Yeah, yeah. And that was a great concert. I saw them in concert in LA, wow. and that was super fun to go back oh, and yeah. get to meet them. And I have a great photo um, with the band where oh, I look so like jealous. a total loser. I mean, they all look so cool, and there's me <laughs> in the middle. We I'm all like, look like losers compared to Stray Kids. <laughs> I know. I always feel. I always feel so hideous when I meet, no. you know, a K-pop idol. I'm like, which one of us doesn't belong? No, <laughs> you, you fit right in. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, so you. maybe for the last one. I mean, you you brought it up yourself, but BTS yeah, right. Dimple, mm-hmm. your Crash Cove oh. collaboration. Yeah, tell us a little about that one. Yeah, I mean, that's that's another collaboration that actually kind of functioned in a similar way to how I just described with uh, with Stray Kids. Um, Actually, maybe a little bit backwards. I think, I think that started with me and Allison Kaplan thinking about BTS, and you know, this is like 2017. Thinking, oh, we should. I want to. I want to write for this band. I want to write for BTS, and we kind of came up with kind of the early genesis of this concept called illegal. And you yes. know, I'm a, Ooh, okay. <laughs> I know. Yep, we know and exactly we, what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, and I'm a you know a keyboard guy first and foremost. So I, uh, you know, we wrote the song kind of with me at the keyboard, and I kind of put a very rudimentary track together, and it was kind of me and Allison going back and forth, coming up with these melodies and writing this writing this concept about illegal kind of quirky, punchy lyrics. Um, a little sexy and then brought in crash cove to kind of beef the track up in a way that again, only he could do. I, I could, you know, it's not my wheelhouse. I could, I could try, uh, but it would take me too long and probably not be as good as just calling a pro who knows exactly how to do that. So kind of the, the trio of me, Allison and crash kind of got the broad strokes of that early idea together, sent it off the, the, the band, liked it and then of course rm steps into the picture and <gasps> once again completely transforms you know what we thought we had we thought oh yeah we have a pretty good song here and then he you know did the lyric translation he did stuff work on the track um and you know completely took our little you know song start uh and turned it into what you know now as dimple or you know bojo gay if I'm even pronouncing that right. Mm. <laughs> RM, classic RM. RM. Not so surprised. Now I, and so that is also a great example of kind of an asynchronous uh, collaboration because he more than pulled his weight on that song. And yet I oh, still yeah. have not met him. Yep. Yep. Not met him. No, and I've never even seen the band in concert. But if <gasps> I do one day, I'll be shouting from the stands. I'll be like, hey, it's me. It's I'm me. your co-writer. <laughs> <laughs> from Dimple. Yeah. So it's it's funny to think that you can collaborate and have co-writers out there that you've never actually met. But that's the magic of collaboration. Yeah. And and technology in this day and age. Right, right. Exactly. Technology enabled. Yeah. Technology enabled that to happen. 
All right. Well, we should uh, wrap things yeah. up, Matthew. Like, thank you so much. I I learned a lot. I'm I'm sure our listeners really appreciate um, just hearing about the the songwriting, music producing process, and and also a lot of the the tracks and and work and things that you've uh, specifically worked on. So. I'm sure they'll be checking out a lot of uh, your credits. Oh, cool. So in, in closing, uh, is there anything that you'd like to plug or promote like that, that you know, your book deal, <laughs> your, uh, your mm-hmm. upcoming song or, or whatever it may be? Um, nothing specifically. I mean, still writing a lot of K-pop. There's some stuff coming out that, you know, I'd be, I'd be better to probably not mention. Um, right. Just because <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Um, but things that I'm very excited about, things are happening, things are busy. Um, but just uh, keep your eye out because I hope to, uh, to continue doing this for another 12 years or however long it's already been. <laughs> Yay. Where can we follow you online or like hear what you're up to? I am primarily on Instagram at Matthew Tischler, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-T-I-S-H-L-E-R. You'll be very glad to hear I am not on TikTok. (laughs) Well, I have a profile, but I'm not doing anything. I'm not posting anything. I just, you know, I just scroll and see what's up. But that's uh, that's where you can find me. Okay, we'll see you on IG. (laughs) Yeah, I'll be there. Okay, well, I think that wraps it up for the the K-pop cast. I'm going to actually ask one last controversial question maybe <gasps> maybe it's controversial we, we can decide whether or not we're going to keep Ooh. it on the episode or not um matthew are you familiar with uh generative ai because oh, no. <laughs> you know I, I i wonder like you said like there's only 12 notes etc like h- how much you how what, what's your view on that technology you know- First of all, it's fascinating, and I have 100% messed around with it to see what it can do. It right. made me a whole uh, vegan meal plan. You know, my wife is plant-based, so I you know, I was testing it. I'm like, make me a vegan meal plan on 2,000 calories a day and just see what it does. And it did. Um, I've, you know, kicked the tires on what its capabilities are on a songwriting front. Of course, it can only do lyrics. Um, they're not great you know i think uh, yeah i don't even know what the legalities are i certainly would not feel comfortable putting them in my music um but i think it's an interesting experiment you know we'll see what happens with it in the months and years to come Uh, it certainly is an interesting way to generate ideas you know if you ask it a question and it kind of might you know from a lyrical perspective maybe it could come up with some ideas that you could build upon to put in your songs but i i would just be too nervous to actually use it in my in my songs i think it would be i don't know i think it would open Mm -hmm. up an unusual can of worms yeah there's (laughs) a lot of ip issues with these like generative ai technologies like uh stable diffusion um an an image generator model for example got into trouble because all their image outputs were starting to have these um Getty Images watermarks oh, yeah. appearing, so it's like very clear where they got the information from, and it's like so Getty naturally filed a lawsuit against them. Of oh course. wow, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, legally speaking, not. It's, uh, not yeah, not well. and and it runs. You run the risk of someone else using it and coming up with a similar thing to you. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it, it's all very. Um, I, I, in my humble opinion, it's very derivative um, yeah. at this point. So. And I also think it defeats the purpose of what music is supposed to be. You yeah. know, the one advantage that music has is that it comes from the heart. Right. And mm. it's meant to be, especially on the lyric front, as we discussed, you know, an hour ago when we first started talking, it's meant to be the true experiences and soul of that artist. So right. I don't think it's just plug and play when it comes to lyrics. I think that takes the soul out of it and the and really the whole point you want to yeah. hear from the artist you don't want to hear from a computer but it's fun to play around with so <laughs> i just wouldn't uh, rely on it all right matthew tischler everyone thank you Woo! matthew for, yes, for joining us for this thank you so much for coming episode. giving us your time thank you so much for having me this was this was really a treat to talk to you all um and i hope this was helpful yeah all right thank you 